I realized that I still really love teaching. I really, really do. So that really、uh, pointed me down that direction. And I feel like what really sealed the deal was during our coaching. You know, when we had that that moment of, you know, after we launched the Mastering Modern Calligraphy course, just something wasn't really clicking as well. So, and then I think I remember you asking me, "What is it that, you know, what is it that you're really passionate about?" So that was what reminded me that I'm passionate about teaching. I'm seeing that this is happening in the market. And I I feel like it is the right. It it was the you know I think the no brainer. It felt right to move down this road to pivot down this road that I think I can say nobody has gone down. Hey there, I'm Maya De Leon, and my mission is to help creatives like you translate what you love to do into a highly profitable income. I'm a mom of three who began as a lettering artist and grew it into a six-figure business. If I made it possible, so can you. Every week, we'll dive deep into topics like building your confidence, getting comfortable talking about money, and nurturing your passion while juggling life and family. So, if you're an ambitious creative who wants to craft the life you love, get cozy, feel at home, and listen to the Confident Creator Show. Calligrapher and creative entrepreneur Joyce Lee started her business in Manchester when she relocated to the UK with her husband in 2014. With a drastic shift in lifestyle and the creative atmosphere in the city, she discovered her passion for calligraphy, and it was there where her brand Arts and Nibs was conceived. Since then, she's worked with various creative campaigns with the likes of John Lewis, Mac Cosmetics, and Topshop. And she's also been a regular demonstrator for manuscript pen company at trade shows like Creative World in Frankfurt and the London Stationery Show for the past years. Joyce has led workshops in different cities like Manchester, London, Amsterdam, and Vienna, and has spoken at various panels in the UK as a creative entrepreneur. And at present, she spends most of her time teaching calligraphy and training other aspiring calligraphy instructors. How to run their own workshops through her teaching calligraphy bootcamp. Welcome to the show, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How are you doing? I am doing great.、Uh, well, it's been a long day, but still, life is good. Can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is so good to hear. It's been good to hear from you since we last met. <laughs> yeah. But- yeah. Thank you for coming to the show. Now, I know a lot of people have known you already, but before I dive into the interview, which, by the way, I'm super excited about, about, could you tell our listeners how you started your calligraphy journey and what made you choose calligraphy?、Um, well, I think I started my calligraphy journey just like everyone else. You know, picking it, I picked it up as a As a hobby, and that was all the way back in 2012, right? And I was working full time, so I was looking for something to,、um, to I guess, escape from my day job, my very busy and draining day job. I, I was a full time teacher at that time, so、um, I picked up calligraphy because my husband collects fountain pens. So one day he just Handed me, you know, one of his pens, and he he just went buy this. So yeah, one thing led to another. I started out, you know, playing around with fountain pens, and then felt like it was a little bit too fragile for me. So I went to the dip pen because it was a lot more affordable, right? And、um, so yeah, then from there I, you know, relocated after two years, and one thing led to another. Started the business. And that is great. Well, with that simple gift from your husband, who knew、yeah. it would turn into something that you have right now? It has yeah, turned yeah. into a whole new business, right? Exactly. And how long exactly. have you been doing this? 
Well, um, it's been this year will be the sixth year, you know, and um, so I started on Seen in 2015, you know, so along the way, I've learned many, many things and I'm really, I would say I'm really grateful that the business has arrived at the six year mark. And wow. uh, I mean, you, you run a business yourself, but you know how, you know, the, the, the phases of a business, right? So being able to come to year six is, uh, you know, I can only say I'm grateful. Um, but of course, along the way, so many ups and downs, isn't it? It's always, it, it, we always have ups and downs. And I think it's natural for every business to have that. And yeah. I don't know, we probably won't learn <laughs> from anything exactly. if we don't have yeah. our ups and downs and it's, that, that is I think that is super essential and we just have to embrace and really just keep moving forward and pushing forward so that even during those downs or when we've hit the plateau we will still be able to have that energy to keep on pushing so that we can get back to the top and on the right path again exactly exactly I think you hit it on the nail you know with with the word embracing um, I think that's the only thing we can do, right? To embrace and just to run with the situation. Yes, whatever that is, like yeah. whatever situation, whatever life throws at us, we'll just keep on pushing. <laughs> yeah, like moving. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no matter how hard it is, we just keep on pushing because this is our baby, this is our business. And, you know, uh, it, it might be difficult, but no matter how difficult things get, we always find a way to make it Definitely. through everything. Definitely. And as long as you, I think it's personally, as long as you love what you do, there's yeah. nothing that's going to stop you from actually doing whatever it is that you have to do so you can scale and grow your business continuously. Exactly. I think, you know, I like to see, I think a lot of people tend to mistake, you know, the, the business journey as quite a linear experience, but um, I don't think it's necessarily so, you know, running a business, it, it can go so many ways. It's just like what you said, you know, life could throw anything at you. So um, I think approaching difficulties and challenges in your business is also not a linear approach as well. There's so many ways to approach it and there's always definitely a way out. It's just whether, where, how much do we want it, right? Yes, how badly do you want it? Yeah. That's It yeah. all boils down to it. How badly do you want to exactly. keep the business running? And exactly. when we are on the topic of the business, now I'm curious, like what were... What was the first job that you have gotten from your calligraphy? And I mean, I'm curious, how did you start monetizing your skills as a calligrapher? Um, honestly, I can't quite remember what exactly is the first job, but you know, it was probably a commission piece, you know, but I think it's safe to say I didn't really earn much from that. <laughs> But I think like uh, some uh, a job that really made me significant income was teaching a workshop. Right, that that in itself, I think that took a couple of months. It was a couple of months into starting the business, um, but that one was really the, I would say for me the 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 pot of gold, right? Where I felt like okay, you know, I I could actually make this work. And it, it was the start of me believing, I think that's the thing, believing that I could sustainably monetize this. That is so good to hear. But I am curious because I can see all of these brands from the bio that you sent me. Yes. <laughs> I yeah. am seeing all these top brands like Dior, Topshop, Mac Cosmetics, yeah. John Lewis. So... I know I'm, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people will be so curious about this. Like, if you yeah. don't mind at all, could you tell us how you landed these jobs for famous brands? Um, I think, I think that that is slightly um different back then, right? Because that that was um uh, back in <laughs> before 2020. So, um, how I landed, you know, the first few jobs with company, they were really just me I wouldn't say cold calling but just putting myself out there contacting people talking to people and 
the thing about being in Manchester is that it's such a small city that you don't actually know, you know, you, you never know who you're actually speaking to because that person who is so down to earth can be, you know, an owner of the building that you're sitting in, something like that. You know, so it's really, for me, it was really just talking to people, emailing people, um, dropping the messages and sending letters actually. So those were the ways that I put myself out there. So you notice it's not so much like social media. Um, yeah, you know, it did play a role, but I think when it came to the tangible projects, you know, the actual money-making projects, um, they were, I don't know if you call that the, the traditional way of, you know, doing sales or what, but um, and that's part of the role. Yeah. yeah, it's more like outreach. That's how yeah, we call yeah. it now. It's, it's outreach, for basically. And it's something that a lot of people are, you know, are dying to know. Like, how do yeah. you do those kinds of outreach? How do you reach out yeah. to certain brands? Where did, you, where did you get those contacts? Like, these are things that people are not willing to do their research and invest yeah. time and effort to actually do the research because it takes a lot of effort to reach out. And that yeah. is why you have different ways of reaching your audience. You can do it either by social media and start attracting the people you want to attract and work with. And then the other way is what you did, which is organically reaching out to the people yeah, who you yeah. want to work with, the brands that you want to work with. And it's interesting that you landed all of these jobs for these famous brands because I think that helped propel the brand Arts and Nibs Definitely. Like quickly, right? Definitely, definitely. I think um, because back uh, when I started the business in the UK, you know, it was a new city. It was a new working culture. It was a new society that I wasn't really familiar with. You know, so I wanted to start this business. And at that time, I felt like I'm really on my own. You know, and I don't really have anyone that I could rely on. I, my network wasn't in the UK. It wasn't in Europe. You know, it was just back in Singapore. So I think that was the, the motivation for me to really just put myself out there and go, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I could just send them an email. I could call them and they'd be like, oh, who's this agent girl? <laughs> you know, I but the, 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 the art scene its name went out. And I think that was the, my sole purpose. And then, of course, you know, when you work with one brand, you, you get recommendation and so forth. And then that's how things grew. True. Yes, yes, yes. That is so true. Because word of mouth can be a powerful marketing yeah. <laughs> tool yeah, as well. Exactly. And I think even more powerful than anything. Yes. And you did it really, really well. But I'm curious because we are talking about arts and nibs. So I haven't asked you this personally, but I am dying to know. <laughs> like, where did the, the brand arts and nibs come from? Like, what is the story behind <laughs> the brand arts and nibs? <laughs> oh, it's, well, it's not like a, you know, like a great Gatsby kind of <laughs> story. <laughs> um, I remember I, I was just sitting in my rented apartment, you know, in Manchester and I was just throwing out different names and I, I wanted it to be like, at that time I was like, okay, I wanted it to be a really hipster name, you know, because millennium, I'm a, rather I'm a millennial. So, you know, we really have to just roll with the hipster vibe, but uh, <laughs> everything that I wanted was taken. So I was a little bit annoyed. And um, at that time we had, we were in this apartment where the dining area and the living area was connected. So we're just sitting at the dining area and as I told you you know my husband collects fountain pens he loves playing with stuff like that and he brought over a lot of fountain pen stuff with him to the UK pen ink paper anything that you know whatever tools that you need for a fountain pen so I was just looking at his stack of mess over there and I just went all right I want to do something artistic so artsy and then I just saw like a whole bunch of fountain pen nibs in front of me I was like all right let's just run with it this is artsy nibs there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's that's it. <laughs> yeah it was so random because at that time I was 
very prepared to rebrand sometime down the road. You know, because I felt like, um, you know, it doesn't really sound that um, legitimate in that sense, you know, at that time didn't really roll off my tongue quite well. But I guess the name just stuck. And, you know, I, I'm glad and six years on, I still haven't felt like I needed to rebrand. Yeah, well, you did a great job <laughs> yeah. branding because yeah. I think the name is great and ultimately people, a lot of people know about it now, which is yeah. interesting because not only, I think you are not only just teaching calligraphy now, you're not only doing calligraphy, you're also teaching calligraphy. And the best part that I have seen from all of this is you have also started teaching other people how to teach calligraphy. So yeah. what made you decide to make that shift from teaching calligraphy to those who are interested in learning about the art to mm. teach people how to actually teach calligraphy. I don't know, that's kind of, it sounds <laughs> like some history going on right here, but yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of teaching calligraphy going on. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of teaching calligraphy going on. So what inspired you to actually do it and make that pivot? I think um, what, a couple of things, and you know, the first thing is, moving back to Singapore, you know, because I'm, I'm essentially entering a different market, right? So as you run a business, then when you enter a new market, you, you know, I sort of had a sensing that it was time to, for a new chapter. When I first came back to Singapore in 20, late 2018, 2019, I had, a, had an inkling that, that I needed to change, but I wasn't sure what, and, you know, I, I spent quite a number of uh, months actually thinking through what I really wanted to do with art scene. It, you know, sure, you know, it, it's something that makes money for me, pays my bills, you know, helps my family get on. Um, but I felt like I needed something, I needed a deeper purpose for art scene. It. And it shouldn't just be that I'm just teaching the craft. I mean, I love that, you know, but. Um, that wasn't really satisfying me at that time. Then the pandemic happened. That was like, mm, all right, uh, I really, really need to rethink the way I operate. So as I saw the shift in what people wanted, I think the pandemic was really the, the kicker, you know, because I started to see a lot of people looking inward to make a living. You know, people were starting to look at you know, because there wasn't really job security, people were looking at, okay, what can I actually do to yeah. earn an extra income, you know, or if I've um, unfortunately been made redundant, what else can I do now that is sort of pandemic proof, you know, so I saw a lot of that going on. And I realized that I still really love teaching. I really, really do. So that really uh pointed me down the direction and i feel like what really sealed the deal was during our coaching you know when we had that that moment of you know after we launched the mastering modern calligraphy course something wasn't really clicking as well so and then i think i remember you asking me what is it that you know, what is it that you're really passionate about? So that was what reminded me that I'm passionate about teaching. I'm seeing that this is happening in the market. And I, I feel like it is the right. It, it was the, you know, I think the no brainer. It felt right to move down this road, to pivot down this road that I think I could say nobody has gone down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the question that I asked before was that what was the number one thing that you will still do even if you mm. don't get paid for it? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And, and then, then that you... was what I, I felt like, um, I felt very strongly about that. I mean, I felt great, you know, sometimes when you feel like this, hey, this is actually uh, the right direction for you, you sort of have this sense of peace and assurance that, okay, this is where I'm going to go, although it's going to be difficult, but it just feels like it's just drawing you down this path. Yes. And it's funny because it's scary 
and exciting at the same time. And you know you're on the right path when you have that kind of feeling. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I kept asking you, I was like, my, is this, <laughs> uh, am, am I just trying to shovel my way through this, you know, like, am I just trying to, to um, lay, lay down the brakes on, on a dirt path that nobody's yep. just gone down? Yeah. Yes. But essentially, I think we decided to go on a little bit slower because right now that is what's happening in your business. You are teaching other yeah. people, but at the same time, you're teaching other people how you teach what yeah. the art is all about. So yeah. essentially, to be able to teach your students how to do that, you have got to do the same thing as well. And you've got to show that, hey, this actually works. Yeah, yeah. That is yeah. how you can build a stronger brand and connection with your audience. You've got to show them that the thing that you're actually teaching them works, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think I, I quite like the, you know, the shift in conversations that I've had since it's always, um, you know, people see me teach in-person classes, people see me teach online classes. I think I share a lot about that on social media. And these are strategies that I am living through. You know, so it's not something that I have applied once. I'm literally living them, living through them, dealing with the challenges at real time. You know, just like like this week, you know, having to deal with a lot of challenges when it comes to preparing for a course. So these are very real life experiences that I, and I'm very fortunate to be able to share. Yes, yeah. So I'm glad that you brought that up because the next question I'm going to ask you is what were the uh marketing tools that you think you've learned in the past six months that we have been together that you think has been more powerful and helpful in your business i think two things the first thing is getting my act together with my emails <laughs> sorting out my email and uh, i think that has been extremely helpful that, that was a very um, systematic approach that i've learned from you you know, just sorting out the emails, working through my list and nurturing the audience in a systematic way. You know, so that was really one big takeaway for me because now when I approach um, a launch or when I approach, uh, um, yeah, any, any product that I want to sell, I, I have that, that plan of tech in my head. So... I think that that is really helpful, you know, to know the direction that I need to go in. You know, what are the exact steps? I know that, you know, all these will come as I brainstorm and conceptualize things even more, but at least I know the direction. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing that I've learned about, you know, different marketing strategies is the messaging. Right, just to be true to the messaging, be very specific with my messaging, be very niche with my messaging. And I mean, we've spoken a lot about this. You know, I've asked you, Nai, should I name this like the teaching creative, creative <laughs> teaching workshop? You know, like, like, not like teaching calligraphy workshop or teaching creative workshop so I can have the wider net. Right. But and one thing that was really helpful was that you really helped me to, or gave me the confidence to stick to, you know, that niche of calligraphy. You know, although in my head, I think that it's a very small market, but I think the truth is that the, the more specific you message, the easier that people remember you. And that's what I felt. Yes, sometimes people think and get scared when they are niching down. Because they think that they are alienating the rest of the world. But yeah. what they don't understand if, is if they're trying to talk to everybody, it's a lot more difficult to send the message because yeah. you don't know who you're actually talking to. And yes, that might be a small market, but it's a small, viable market. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And that's I, I have I have a story of another client of mine. Um, hopefully, I can get her on the podcast as well. But... It's interesting because when we first uh, uh, talk about it, she was 
actually hesitant and focusing on her French speaking students. But ultimately, that is how she made the biggest jump in her business. And it was super, super like a big validation for everybody who has been doubting about niching down and really getting deeper into who you should be talking to. Because yeah. you cannot talk to everybody if you try that, that is a losing game. You have yeah. got to focus on who your audience really are so that you can have a better understanding of what they need and give exactly. them exactly that, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's so counterintuitive, but I feel like that that is definitely one of the most um, important things to remember. An important thing that I've learned, actually. It's good. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so happy to hear that because sometimes, you know, when we are all in the coaching sessions, like um, uh, <laughs> we didn't plan on talking about the coaching, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when we are in coaching sessions, sometimes I feel like I might not be, you know, connecting with you at all, or I might be saying things too much. I might be overwhelming you. Sometimes I feel mm -hmm. that. Because yeah. whenever, especially during the first few weeks when we are all yeah. starting to settle down, and yeah. that's what, so even if I'm already a coach, sometimes I worry about that too, specifically mm -hmm. with one-on-one, -on -one, the VIP coaching, because you all have these different needs, and I'm talking to different yeah. people. Like, I am approaching from a standpoint of how can I really help this person yeah. propel her business a lot faster, because I know how to do it. But ultimately, mm -hmm. I wanted to help you actually do it. Yeah. yeah. The knowledge that I will be sharing with you is easy to do. Like, I can yeah. just tell you how to do it. But actually making you work for it is the mm -hmm. best thing that I think it's it's one of the best part of being a coach. Yeah. yeah. It's not just the knowledge that you are imparting. You're actually teaching yeah. people how to build that discipline and that mental toughness. Yeah. To be able to do all the thing, all the things that you are asking them to do, like yeah, yeah, and I and I think that you know you said it, what you said about you know you're constantly asking yourself whether you know you're you're doing you're being overwhelming or you're, you're giving the right thing, and that is, I personally feel a a trait of an educator, you know because we're constantly thinking about what can I you know, how can I um, better bring this across? How can I, you know, help you to understand? How how can I figure out your needs and then um, address that? And an educator is always thinking about that. You know, it's always trying to think in the shoes of your student. So, True. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's another way that, you, you know, you can also market every product that you have as an educator you know exactly what to teach because you have taught so many different people right and yeah. you have that experience you sharing that knowledge to a lot of people will help you yeah get, yeah trust you get more people to buy products from you all of those so build that no like and trust factor Definitely. and it, yeah so that's and I, big time i've also i think in my last um free training session last weekend you know I told my uh, the group of participants and I said you know there's a reason why I always say that I have taught across you know many different countries because that is my um my specialty you know okay my specialty isn't to teach in many countries but my specialty is being able to teach people of different backgrounds, different learning abilities, different backgrounds, different learning styles, different That's, cultures. Yeah, exactly. You know, so my clients or people who come through my my courses now, they are people of varied backgrounds from different countries. You know, so that is something that I I really enjoy doing. Something that I am extremely fortunate to be able to experience and then apply to my business and help people apply to their workshop. Yeah, so how, how has teaching 
helped you like really appreciate what you are doing, what you did, and how has it helped you in terms of, you know, how you view as you view your life right now, your life as a business owner, as a creative business owner, because I'm pretty sure that made a lot of impact on you being an educator. I know it did for me, so I'm pretty sure it did uh, the same thing for you, but I'm curious, how did it impact your life? as a calligrapher, as an instructor, and as, you know, a creative business owner. And maybe perhaps that experience of yours could essentially put some light, <laughs> like, <laughs> fire, light up yeah. and inspire many other people who are aspiring to teach yeah. others who they know. I think, uh, well, the first thing, how has teaching, you know, changed or affected my, influenced my view on calligraphy itself is that now I fully understand why it's not as easy to learn calligraphy you know so many times we go oh, all right it looks quite easy and then you know when people actually try it they go oh it actually doesn't it doesn't feel as easy as it looks you know but I think a lot of people tend to stop there a lot of instructors tend to stop there you know it's not as easy as it looks you know but but I think teaching calligraphy for so many years has made me understand the very specific reasons why it's not easy to learn. You know, so it, it to me, it's not just about the techniques and everything. It really um, flows over to your your disposition. So I feel I feel like I don't want to go into like this. Um, oh, it's like yoga and stuff. Like it's all about your mindset, posture, and everything. But it it is, and I would sure. I am very sure that, you know, when you talk to any other artist who teach their art, they will say the same thing. You know, so this has given me a deeper understanding of calligraphy and why it seems complicated to different people. You know, so I can sort of tell if I am teaching a group of people in New York City, I kind of know what are the things that they will struggle with as compared to say, you know, if I, if I teach a class in Amsterdam, I'll, I'll also kind of know that, okay, maybe these people will struggle with these different aspects of calligraphy, right? So yeah, so deeper insights into the craft. Um, but how has it influenced my lifestyle? Is it my lifestyle and all? I think it has made me realize that the world is very big out there. We are all very, very different. And as an educator, when I go into a classroom, I should never, you know, assume that someone can only learn a certain way. You know, so I have to be very open-minded. Although, you know, earlier I mentioned, if I, if I teach a class in New York City, I sort of know what their style is like. But at the same time, when I go down into, on an individual level, I, I've learned to become a lot more open-minded yeah, when I talk to different people. And I think that spills over to life, you know, just to be yes. honest. Yeah. People yeah. have different methods of learning. Yeah, we have yeah, different yeah. methods of learning. And it's good. Yeah. And for me, the way that education and teaching has permeated into my life is that when I teach online and when I teach about all of these mindset and money and all of these stuff, especially these days where I talk about it a lot, when I do have, you know, when I teach students, I do the same thing with my kids. <laughs> like, um, and I sometimes I even tell them, you know, people pay me to learn all of these stuff. You have yeah, yeah. <laughs> So pay attention, kiddos. Pay, pay attention. Mom is teaching you something. But I know that on a on a deeper level, that might not be something that they may understand like fully, but I know that they are absorbing some of it. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah, they, have, yeah. they are 15, so I'm pretty sure they're watching they me. Planted the seed. <laughs> yes, they are. I'm planting the seed and they are sponged yeah. right now. They're still absorbing yeah. those. And yes, they may be 15. <laughs> they are still my babies. And I think the way they <laughs> learn is by watching me. I do what I do because yeah. sometimes I will just 
we will be on a dinner table and then they'll ask me something about the business. Like, mom, how do you grow your following? Because they have their own, mm -hmm. I don't know how they did that, but they were able to create their own YouTube account. Mm -hmm. oh. of <laughs> frankly, they have more followers than I do on YouTube, <laughs> which is kind of funny, but sometimes. Very interesting. Have, Good job. I, uh, the way that I teach my students is also like somehow some some of it has been slowly permeating into my daily life and the way that I talk to my children. I have learned to be even more patient because mm -hmm. usually it's hard to de deal with children. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's different. Yeah, it's 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 not easy, and especially and I think it also um is the Probably because I I don't like being in a classroom setup. Mm -hmm. So the minute that I uh, graduated from engineering, I was like, yeah, it's time to go. I don't want to ever be in a classroom anymore. Yeah. So when I learned or started learning online again, I was like, this is a different experience. I never yeah. thought that. It's part of me that I thought, well, you know, I'm never going to be learning from anyone again, ever again. Yeah. But changed when I started learning online and this is a new form of learning and I want my children to know that classroom is not the only way to learn there's a sure. whole bunch of things out there that you can learn from and yeah. when they see me do what I do I hope it inspires them because sometimes mm -hmm. yeah they're just watching and you don't know they're yeah. actually paying attention and that has oh, been yeah. Yeah, powerful for me. So I am teaching my students, but at the same time, my kids are watching behind me and actually are paying attention to how I teach my students and they're learning from it. It's right. pretty cool. Yeah. That's very interesting. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so as much as I would love, you know, to keep you joyous, because I know it's quite late on your end as well, but this has been a fun conversation. Like teaching is actually thing a thing that we are both passionate about. Yeah. But before I let you go, can you, do you have any like message to those calligraphers or letterers who might be aspiring to teach other people what message you have for them like maybe give them some inspiration mm, I think the very important thing to remember is that as an artist when you want to dive into teaching you need to start thinking like a teacher so you know, uh, many times when we want to justify our ability to teach as artists, we tend to improve our artistic skills, you know, but we don't actually think about improving our teaching skill and our, you know, just the skills that you need as a teacher, planning, lesson planning and stuff like that. So that is actually extremely important, equally as important as your artistic skill. and. You can learn that at the Teaching Calligraphy Bootcamp. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and I believe Joyce has a freebie for us as well. Can you tell us about your freebie, please? Well, uh, I have a free e-guide that you can get on my website. Pop an email, you can get it. And that is essentially um, five ways that I have learned that you can apply to set up a profitable calligraphy workshop or a lettering workshop. Yep. Okay. So I will put all of those in the show notes. If you want to find everything that Joyce has given us, all of her, like, uh, we can find you online. Tell us before yeah. I will, I definitely will forget about that. So <laughs> where can we find Arts and Names online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I basically live there. So that that's, I post code as Instagram. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, you can go to my website, artsingnets.com. Um, on that, you, you get all your resource and information on, what, on how you can work with me. Yeah. Okay. So that is Arts and Nibs, A R P S Y Y N I B S dot com. 
Okay, and on Instagram, it's also Artsy Nibs, and all over the interwebs, it's Artsy Nibs. And you will find all of these links. I'm going to post all of them in the show notes. Just head over to mydeleon.com slash Joyce, J-O-Y-C-E. So you can get everything that Joyce have shared with us today. Okay, and as as, as well... <laughs> I keep stuttering <laughs> as well as these episode show notes. Okay, so go there and you will find everything. All right. So thank you so much for being with us today, Joyce. I appreciate You're your welcome. Thank, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. But you're always welcome on the podcast, and hopefully we can have you for a second round maybe next time. Okay. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> All right. Nice. All right. <laughs>